Hey guys, alright? Welcome everyone. 20 years after the first alien invasion in 1996, Earth is at peace. The nations have set aside their differences and will create the program, Earth Space Defense. With the pieces they recovered from the crashed alien ships, they managed to reverse engineer alien technology and create a warning system against extraterrestrial threats. ESD is headquartered in Area 51, with bases on the Moon, Mars, and Saturn's Moonria. What Earthlings don't know is that there are still aliens observing our planet, and former President Whitmore continues to have nightmares about it. These dreams show him a strange vision of a circular figure with a line that he can't stop drawing. Meanwhile, on the Moon base, Jake and Charlie are towing new parts for the base's defense system to create a giant weapon. In the process, something mysteriously goes wrong, and the Tuggers can't keep the weapon upright. Commander Jang orders the boys to retreat, but Jake ignores the orders and uses his ship to push the weapon back into place. He activates the fusion drive, which could potentially ignite the ship, but Jake works quickly to put the weapon back in place before that can happen. When he returns to the base, Jang still reprimands Jake, blaming him for the mistake, and suspends him indefinitely. In Area 51, General Adams is called to the base for an emergency. The aliens they captured 20 years ago have been in a catatonic state until now. They suddenly woke up and are trembling in their cages. Adams wants to discuss this with the ESD director, but he is unreachable. It turns out that David is in Africa with Floyd, a government-appointed liaison. They meet with Warlord Umdutu and his rebel forces, whose headquarters are surrounded by alien bones. They are not pleased to see David, but before things can escalate, Catherine intervenes and assures the warriors that David is with her. Apparently, Catherine has been working here for some time, studying Umbutu's psychic connection with the aliens. Catherine takes David to see the only ship that landed on Earth 20 years ago. The locals fought against the aliens who emerged from this ship for 10 years, and Umbutu explains that the ship's lights turned on by themselves two days ago. They also discover a giant hole in the ground, revealing that the aliens were trying to drill to the planet's core and stopped when they blew up the mothership during the first war. The group enters the ship and finds that the computer is sending a signal that David recognizes as a distress call that someone has already answered. Back on the moon, Jake has a video call with his girlfriend Patricia, who is Whitmore's daughter. Patricia informs him that the International Legacy Squadron will be visiting the lunar base soon, and this includes Jake's friend Dylan, with whom he had a fight a few years ago. Jake nearly killed Dylan during a flight test, so Patricia wants Jake to be nice and admit that it was his fault. The next day, the squadron arrives, and everyone is excited to meet Dylan because he is the stepson of the first war hero, Stephen. During lunch, Jake meets Dylan and instead of being friendly, provokes him, saying that Dylan was getting in the way again. This leads to Dylan punching him, drawing Jong's attention. Jake takes the blame for Dylan and claims that he just tripped before returning to his room, where he admits to Charlie that he went too far. The following day, in the infirmary at Area 51, Dr. Isaacs visits her husband Oaken, the research director who fell into a coma during the first war. To her shock, Oaken suddenly wakes up, unaware that two decades have passed until he sees how much Isaacs has changed. Meanwhile, Adams receives news that the base on Rhea has been completely destroyed, and they are now on red alert. In Africa, David is finally informed about the emergency, but Catherine is still obsessed with analyzing the circular drawings that are everywhere. Umbuta takes them to his office and shows all the drawings he made based on the visions he had and that the ship awakened. The circle looks more like some kind of device, and Umbutu managed to decipher part of the alien language. On the moon, everyone begins to panic when they notice a whirlwind forming in the atmosphere. It turns out to be a wormhole, from which emerges a spherical machine that resembles Umbutu's vision. They send a transmission to President Lanford and David, who realize that this sphere is a spaceship. Lanford thinks they should attack first, but David points out that this is not the same type of ship as the last invasion. It could come from a different alien race with different intentions. Lanford allows the ESD board to vote, and the strike first option wins. Jung activates the base's massive weapon and easily takes down the sphere. David wants them to retrieve it for study, and Lanford agrees to send a team of scientists, but David must return to DC for political reasons, which leaves David furious. 
Lanford makes a public announcement that they have defended Earth from a second attack. Whitmore sees this on TV and gets nervous because he realizes these are not the same aliens, so he thinks he should warn everyone. Patricia thinks he needs to calm down and trust the new president. Whitmore agrees to go to bed, but when Patricia checks on him later, she finds him missing. Meanwhile, Jake understands David's frustration and wants to help. He goes behind John's back and steals a ship that flies to Africa, where he picks up David, Floyd, Umbutu, and Catherine. After a turbulent journey through the wreckage of the old mothership, they find the sphere, and Jake and David prepare to retrieve it. On Earth, the US is holding a celebration to commemorate the anniversary of the First War's victory. Whitmore interrupts Lanford's speech to try to warn everyone, but at that moment, his head starts to hurt, and he faints. In the hospital room, Oaken is drawing formulas on the walls when he suddenly feels the same pain, and Umbutu feels the same sensation. People on the moon are shocked to see a new alien mothership arriving and getting very close to the surface. Charlie rushes to take control of the ship and picks up Jake and David just before they are crushed. Adams receives the alert on Earth and cancels the celebration while Jake takes control of the ship so Charlie can grab the sphere with robotic arms. It takes a few attempts to succeed, but when they are ready to go, they discover that the mothership has its own gravity and is pulling the ship towards it. Jang sends the pilots and activates the giant weapon, but the shot fails, and the pilots have to return. The mothership returns fire and destroys the weapon, so Jiang orders everyone to evacuate before the ship gets too close and destroys a large part of the moon, including the base. ESD activates the orbital defense system, but the mothership destroys all the satellites before they can fire. A few minutes later, the mothership hits Earth, dragging Jake's ship with it. The proximity starts causing the destruction of several cities, and the ship's gravity begins to lift people and buildings. David realizes they want to land in the North Atlantic Ocean, and Jake has to start making crazy maneuvers to avoid being hit by debris. Lanford orders the evacuation of all coastal cities, but some boats don't receive the message in time. David's father, Julius, is sailing when he sees the ship arriving. He calls David to say that this ship is much larger than the last one, but the call ends when the mothership lands, and Julius is hit by another boat. Elite pilots come from the moon to help with the defense, but Dylan doesn't arrive in time and has to watch his mother help a woman and a baby escape before going to the hospital building. Whitmore and Patricia meet with Adams in Area 51, and Oaken escapes from his room to join their meeting. The aliens in the cages have gone mad, and Oaken thinks they are celebrating. While David and the others arrive, Whitmore sneaks into a sealed room and frees one of the aliens to establish communication. The alien uses its tentacle to grab Whitmore and speak through him, saying, she has arrived, she is all. Catherine shows the circular symbol to the alien, asking what it means, which makes the alien furious. The soldiers realize the rage is about to kill Whitmore, so they shoot the alien to stop it. The bullets don't do much, but Umbutu intervenes and uses his blades to attack the alien. This large body is just in armor, and once it's broken, the true small alien comes out, which Umbutu kills immediately. Meanwhile, on the coast, a group of siblings who have just lost their parents is trying to escape by car and find shelter. Among the wreckage, they discover Julius's destroyed boat and the unconscious man inside. They confirm that he is still alive and take him with them. The Area 51 team scans the mothership, which helps David understand that she is all means that the aliens are a large hive, and their great queen has just arrived. David points out that during the first war, they won by destroying the mothership, which means there must have been another queen inside the ship at that time. This implies that they don't need to destroy this much more powerful ship, they just need to kill the queen. Lanford authorizes a mission to find the queen, and all the pilots prepare. Drones will fly ahead to disable the shields, then the pilots will provide cover for the bombers that will fire cold fusion warheads that should penetrate the hull and kill the queen. The pilots approach the mothership, which immediately opens its defenses. The jets do their best to fly around it and maintain a defensive posture, but the ship is heavily guarded and impossible to reach the top of. After losing two bombers, Jake points out that entering the ship is their only chance. Dylan agrees it's dangerous but also the only way, so Adams authorizes them to go while ordering the others to provide support. When the jets enter, they are shocked to see that there is a whole ecosystem inside. At that moment, 
Whitmore wakes up and tells Patricia that the Queen knows they are coming. Patricia rushes to Adams to inform him that it's a trap, but it's too late, the Queen sends out a special wave that disables all the jets. The pilots begin to fall to their deaths but still release the bombs to try to complete the mission. Unfortunately, the explosion doesn't reach the Queen because she is surrounded by an energy field. Suddenly, a second wave comes from the alien system, and this one is so large that it disables all the satellites, Area 51, and the President's bunker. Then the mothership takes the opportunity to attack the bunker, killing everyone inside, including Lanford. Moments later, military leaders arrive at Area 51 and appoint Adams as the new President of the United States. Catherine shows Oaken's drawings to Mbutu, and he manages to translate some of them. There are mentions of an intergalactic war and something about stopping an enemy before it reaches Earth. This makes Umbuta realize that the Sphere wants to be an ally because the aliens are also their enemies. Inside the mothership, Jake and Dylan, along with some other pilots, have managed to survive the fall, so now they need to hide in the ecosystem to avoid being caught. At the base, Oaken manages to open the capsule with a special laser and scans the Sphere, but he can't detect any signal. Floyd approaches to touch the sphere out of curiosity, and the smooth surface starts absorbing his hands. After a few seconds, the sphere activates and releases Floyd before starting to communicate in English, which it learned from Floyd's mind. At the same time, the queen receives a reading in her system and decides to put on a large suit of armor. The pilots can only watch as the top of the mothership suddenly takes off to initiate a new attack. The Sphere begins to explain that it intercepted the alien's distress call and came to try to warn humans, but humans attack the Sphere without asking questions first. The Sphere species has fought against the invading aliens before, they call the motherships reaping ships because they go from planet to planet harvesting the cores to use as fuel. This Sphere is the last survivor of its planet, and its system holds the key to superior technology. There is a hidden planet where it teaches refugees from other fallen worlds to build weapons that will defeat the invaders, that's why the aliens fear it. Unfortunately, now that the sphere is activated, the queen can track it. David points out that if the queen is already coming, they can lure her just as she lured them first. Oaken and David think they can hide the real sphere inside an isolation chamber and replicate its radiation signal with a bait inside a tug full of cold fusion bombs, so the queen will follow that signal into a trap. The only thing they need is a way to track the Queen, and Adams reveals that they still have a radar truck from the First War. Adams and David talk to the few remaining pilots, explaining that since the satellites are inoperative, someone will have to fly manually to detonate the bombs, which means that pilot won't survive the mission. Patricia tries to volunteer, but Whitmore intervenes and accepts the mission, ignoring his daughter's disapproval. Meanwhile, Julius wakes up and convinces the siblings to take him to Area 51. However, they are running out of gas and moving at a snail's pace. They stop at a gas station and find a school bus full of children that was abandoned by the driver, so Julius takes control and, with all the children on board, starts driving the bus towards Area 51. Inside the mothership, the pilots find the alien's hangar. Jake rushes ahead to distract the aliens by insulting them and urinating on their floor while his friends steal the jets. The aliens don't take Jake's insults lightly and open fire, but before they can hit Jake, the pilots take off in the jets and pick up Jake. Immediately, the aliens start pursuing them and closing the doors, so the pilots need to make some extra maneuvers to avoid being killed. In the heat of the battle, Jake apologizes to Dylan for almost killing him all those years ago. After a few tense moments, the pilots manage to reach the doors and escape before they close. Everyone at the base prepares for the attack. Patricia watches her father depart despite her protests and decides to fly alongside to help him. At that moment, Julius and the children arrive by bus just as the Queen arrives with her army. As the base and the aliens begin firing to start a new war, David notices the bus and takes it to his area for protection. The sphere is placed in the isolation chamber, and the Queen falls into the trap, believing that Whitmore has the real signal. Patricia flies her jet close to her father's and says her goodbyes before he faces his sacrifice. While David puts a shield around the alien army to contain the explosion, Whitmore enters the Queen's ship and detonates the bombs. For a moment, the team believes they've won, but for some reason, the alien army is still attacking, and the base's massive weapon is taken down. 
As the smoke clears, it's revealed that the queen is still alive because she protected herself with her own energy shield. David gets on the bus with Julius and the children so they can drive while the queen starts chasing them. Every soldier on the ground returns to the base to defend the sphere from the approaching aliens, while the pilots attack the queen, whose shield keeps her safe. The boat crew notices there are only six minutes left, and at that moment, Patricia realizes that the queen lowers her shield for a few seconds when she needs to attack. She seizes this opportunity and shoots at her weak spot, destroying the shield and leaving her vulnerable. The queen retaliates by attacking her jet, and Patricia escapes with a parachute before crashing. Then the queen tries to go after her, but at that moment, Dylan and the others return and attack the queen with their own technology. Inside the base, the aliens find the sphere, which is guarded by Oaken and Isaacs, and send a message to their queen with the location. Dylan and his team lose control of the jets because the queen uses her connection to the hive to make all their technology fly around her to form a new shield. Umbutu and Floyd rush to the isolation chamber to fight the aliens, but in the fight, one alien manages to hit Isaacs. While Umbutu and Floyd finish off the aliens, Oaken has to say goodbye to his husband. With only two minutes left, the queen arrives at the base and starts pounding on the roof to try to access the sphere. Dylan calls the jet shield a tornado, and this gives Jake an idea, they activate the manual thrusters and allow the tornado to create a fire whirl that propels them out of the hive. As the queen finally invades the base and grabs the sphere, the pilots regain control of the jets and open fire on her, forcing her out of her armor. The queen tries to retreat and almost hits the bus, but David returns just in time before the queen falls and finally dies, releasing the sphere in the process. Just as it happened during the first war, the queen's death instantly stops the drilling and all the alien ships, which crash to the ground. Everyone around the world celebrates the victory as the mothership departs, and Oaken confirms that the sphere is safe. David is concerned that Earth won't survive another attack, but Oaken reminds him that the Sphere has a training program on a shelter planet, so the next step for humanity is to join the intergalactic war.